And my final thing is, uh, we are doing some fundraising. We're doing a fundraising event with the uh, with the Jimmy John's Field folks, with the United Shore Professional Baseball League. We are selling tickets for the Friday, June 22nd game. So it's the game. It's a Friday night game. It's the Mammoths versus the Beavers. I didn't make up these names. Uh, and there is fireworks that night. Uh, tickets are 25 bucks. Ten of it goes to the museum. So if you're interested in the ticket, over the window, see Wendy, and she can get you set up with that. Uh, it's, you get admission to the game, uh, hot dog, chips, a beverage. You get to see the game, you get to see the fireworks. So if you're a baseball first, a minor league baseball first, it should be kind of cool. And 10 bucks goes to the game. And that money is going to go to our flagpole fund. We're still a little bit short on, the, on raising funds to put a flagpole up. So that's what that's for. So that's the end of my commercials. Again, we are an all volunteer organization. Please uh, feel free to put money in the gray box on your way out if you haven't already. And without any further delay, I'm right. We had 700 uh, stories uh, there in the museum. We just went through and looked at it all. We had 874 stories uh, through this last week until I went up. And, and if I forget to tell you about the last story, the 75th story, uh, you guys remind me at the end because it's an amazing story. But um, <coughs> thank God I to use this here. Um, our mission is to uh, honor, respect, and remember. Uh, Michigan service men and women. So we tell the individual stories of Michigan service men and women, and uh, uh, we have 140 to 150 stories out at any given time uh, about uh, what they've done and, and who they were, and, uh, and uh, mainly about their military service, but some of the stories go on a little bit in the civilian life. We've got the uh, eight galleries um, right now. We've got the uh, World War One gallery, World War II gallery, Korean War, Vietnam, uh, Desert Storm, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as current global war on terror. We've got our astronauts from the um, Michigan, those uh, stories, and space pioneers as well. And then we've got our two really uh, unique galleries, our Cross Gallery, which are all Cross recipients, so Distinguished Service Cross, Navy Cross, Air Force Cross. And then we've got the largest collection anywhere in the United States of named medals of honor, right there um, in Frankenmuth. And it's an amazing collection. And uh, I think uh, one of the first stories I have here is is about that. Uh, it, um, one, one of those guys, anyway, that was right here from your backyard. Um, but the museum started back in 1976. Uh, the uh, Stan Bozich got the um, museum started with a uh, with the 501c3 that we uh, received in November of 1976. And then uh, in 1980, he actually uh, started the museum at the Schoolhouse Square there in uh, Frankenmuth. And then just before they tore it down, he found uh, uh, a new home for the museum <coughs> just south of uh, uh, the main part of town, south, uh, southeast, and just north of Bronner's on, on Weiss Street. Um, and it's a little off the beaten path. Uh, we don't see as many visitors as I think we could, but last year we still had over 12,000 visits. Um, we're open every day of the week. I think we were closed on Easter, we closed on Thanksgiving, New Year's uh, Day, and then Christmas. Those are, you know, uh, but other than that, we're open. Uh, and because we believe that this uh, history just needs to be, needs to be told. Um, a little bit, I got ahead of myself. So, uh, Corporal Joseph Bowen, he's like, he's, uh, Born in Detroit in 1891, uh, he, in, um, uh, let's see, what is it, uh, October 30th, 19, 1916, he actually, um, in uh, the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, he uh, received his um, Medal of Honor. You can see uh, uh, we've got a little bit of uh, things in his display, including his uh, medal there. Um, but he... Uh, um, hit by enemy fire during the attack, 
um, and forced to seek medical attention. But one of the interesting things, he came back, nobody knew. He never publicized it. He retired from the Detroit police force, right? And he never talked to the police about it or anything. It wasn't until they were researching his retirement that anybody even found out about it. And then after that, he never really talked about it again. Uh, the museum uh, found out about it because uh, Stan Bosich, uh, his, Stan was a, a, a Royal Oak firefighter. His brothers uh, all uh, served all around uh, fire departments in Detroit, Royal Oak, and, and all around the uh, greater Detroit area. And his brother, John, happened to be on the, um, uh, he was a chief arson investigation uh, in the city of Detroit. And so he, when Stan needed to find information on somebody, he'd call up his brother, and his brother uh, would, would do some investigating for him. But one of the things that uh, he did is he um, tracked down a relative of Joseph Bowen, and he went over to the house, and, and uh, the, they were super happy <coughs> to find somebody. They didn't have any relatives, anybody to pass it on to, and they were ecstatic that the story was going to uh, continue on. Um, uh, Emmett Bowman. Uh, Emmett was uh, U.S. Navy. Um, he's the only, um, well, he's the only black uh, survivor of the Time Death March, right? He was uh, captured on on, uh, um, on uh, geez, where is it? He doesn't have it on here. Um, I apologize, but uh, he was. Um, uh, Good grief, I'm going to try to find it now also. I haven't had this story out for a little bit. But uh, at Corregidor, yeah, he was, they were actually at, at uh, Corregidor, and uh, he was off uh, the submarine getting uh, food and supplies and such, and uh, an airplane strafed, hit him in the, uh, he, he was hit in the head, and he was in the hospital when the Japanese uh, took Corregidor. He ended up going through the Bataan Death March as well, um, and he became the only black survivor uh, of the, the uh, Bataan Corregidor Defenders Organization, the only, the only black man in there. Spent a total of 1,350 days as a prisoner of war. Um, amazing story, amazing man. Um, his, when he was on board ship, he was um, uh, supposed to, he, the only job for a black man in the Navy at the time uh, on board a submarine was a, a steward, you know, captain steward or officer steward, and he ends up uh, a, the the one sh uh, first uh, ship he was on. He said that or, or sub he was on. The he said that the uh, the captain said, you know what, on this ship you're going to do everything that every other sailor is going to do. So you're going to post watch. You're going to do everything just like everybody else. And he really ex uh, respected that and admired that captain for going out on a limb. And he said that uh, when he went to other stations, uh, his cap his captain actually called ahead and said, "Hey, this guy can do anything you guys you guys uh, need him to." He's, he gave him a stamp of approval. Uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel Roger Walden, U.S. Army. He was um, uh, one of the sixteen, uh, the first sixteen uh, African American uh, paratroopers uh, with the triple nickel. He ended up uh, going through. And uh, in 1944, uh, later in 44, as a staff sergeant, they asked him to go through OCS. He goes through officer candidate school, and uh, he became a second lieutenant. He rose, um, you know, after the war to um, a captain. And then during Korea, he ends up uh, receiving the Silver Star. Um, he, he's, he's, they're in the middle of a very close battle where they're pitching grenades back and forth uh, uh, from their positions and, and uh, taking damage. He calls it an artillery strike on his position in order to uh, eliminate the enemy. Uh, just uh, an amazing man. Uh, retired uh, a lieutenant colonel in, in back at that time. That's, that's an amazing story for, for uh, uh, an African American to, to uh, be able to um, not only uh, serve his country with pride, but receive the recognition and, and those advancements as well. Uh, Natalie Clicks, uh, uh, she um, 
in, in her service, um, I, she would have been the first one to say, you know, and I really, I, I really didn't do that much. I was switchboard operator, uh, General MacArthur's headquarters. Um, it, but she was an amazing person in her service to veterans. After her service, she was, uh, you know, I don't even know if I can go through everything here. Um, uh, but she, uh, um, honor guard for the Women's uh, Army uh, Corps Veteran Association, post commander twice for American Legion Post, uh, Allied Veterans Council of Wayne County, uh, commander for the uh, of the Consolidated War Veterans Council of Michigan, past uh, past. Uh, president for the Women's Overseas Service League, um, and then she served as a deputy representative for the Ann Arbor VA Medical Center and a chaplain at the Allen Park VA. And so she, there wasn't much she did she wasn't willing to do for veterans in her service to um, uh, veterans after the war. Um, uh, this next one is really great, uh, amazing story. Can't my uh, Rick Collins. Rick Collins, when, when he's a, a kid, he lives three blocks away from Briggs Stadium. And he says he's sitting in the stands there and, um, and while they're taking batting practice and everything. And he said he was the smallest boy there, a uh, little blonde hair kid at the time. And he said uh, Hank Greenberg's out there taking batting practice and he asked him to go shed flies for him. And uh, he said Fred A was bitten by the the, the bug ever since then. He said his grandmother um, uh, called Hank Greenberg. Hank walked him home that day uh, and um, invited him to come back every day that they were in town uh, taking batting practice. And he'd walk him home every day. And his grandmother came to give him the, the uh, 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 Hank Greenberg the um, nickname Hankus Pankus. So, um, <laughs> but uh, he said that uh, he. he Hank Greenberg nicknamed him Whitey. So when he was a kid, that was his nickname. And he, he kept that all the, um, you know, for uh, most of his life um, until he, he ends up joining the Marines. He uh, uh, wanted to be a pilot. He didn't get to be a pilot. Um, but in late 42, he did get transferred to flight school in Pensacola. Um, and then um, when he's uh, over um, flying, and I don't know why, we don't have it written here, doo, 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 doo. Um, he receives the uh, nickname Rip, um, but uh, um, one of the very cool things is uh, how he met his wife. He was stationed, and he's, he's a, a pilot, uh, a hot shot marine pilot, and uh, um, his, his wife, he, he met her, and uh, she worked on base, and uh, one day he's up flying and he sees her at the bus stop. He bounces his, his plane off the top of the, the bus a couple times. The bus stops, he lands, and he finally gets her to uh, take a date. That's the story. I don't know how he wouldn't get in trouble for something like that. But, um, that's the family, the family legend that lives on. Um, it's a good one. Right, absolutely. So he comes back. And uh, he, he worked as equipment manager for the Detroit, Detroit Lions. Um, and uh, it, uh, he ends up going back to the Air Force during um, uh, Korea as well. Um, but uh, Detroit uh, Tigers visiting clubhouse custodian as well. Um, when he was custodian for the uh, <coughs> Tigers, he says he, he met all kinds of amazing players. but. They treated him just like your average, you know, uh, uh, janitor or whatever. He said, so one day, I took my shadow box with his ribbons and everything, and he took it in and he put it on the wall. And he said, after, after that, he said, the first person to notice it was Reggie Jackson with the New York Yankees. He said, Reggie came up, we talked and everything. He said, from that day forward, I never had to pick up another towel. I never had to clean up another mess. He said, these guys look you know, uh, looked up to him like like a hero, because he was. And it's uh, just an amazing, uh, amazing thing. Um, so from Reggie Jackson to Jose Canseco, uh, are some of the names that, uh, that uh, of the guys that um, he got to know, got to know, I should say. Um, 
here from the Triton, Michigan area also. You guys, uh, this guy here is very famous. Uh, you see the, the Secret Service Cross. Uh, the Army was a, a pilot, uh, Major Urban Drew, um, Army Air Corps. He ends up uh, shooting down uh, the first German jet, the, the ME-262. But when he does so, he, the jet, the, those, those guys had already taken out his his, uh, his wing, uh, um, uh, wing man. So he didn't have anybody to verify it, never got credit for it. After after the war, he's writing his story <coughs> about, about that. And uh, he also took out um, uh, a, another 262. Um, but when he uh, uh, was telling the stories after the war, he talks about that first flight. And nobody, um, uh, disagreed with them, but they just couldn't verify it. And he says what he did is he waited for the guy to get behind him and start firing threw on his air brakes, let him fly by and, and nosed up and, and, and took him. And that's the same way he took out the second 262. He's the only uh, pilot to take out two ME-262s uh, there. And as it was, that first one he took out was the first 262. Um, uh, Major Eater uh, from the Luftwaffe would later read that story in, a, in an article and said, I'll be darned, that's exactly the way it happened when I lost my wingman. He verified that first kill for uh, Major Drew, and Major Drew ended up receiving the, the uh, Distinguished Service Cross after, after that. So that's kind of interesting. Um, after that, we've got a picture of uh, uh, Major Eater and, and uh, Major Drew down at the um, uh, in Dayton. Uh, they became fast friends after that. Um, got another Detroit Tiger story here. Pirate Joseph Moser. Joe, um, he's actually a cousin of one of the guys that's in the museum uh, uh, or that uh, was on our board until recently. Uh, I know you guys have met him recently, Tony, uh, Deanna. Uh, Joe uh, Mosheri, so he says uh, Mosheri's uh, at the Eastern Market, right, um, and such. He's, um, Joe uh, was recruited by uh, the legendary Tiger Scout, Wish Egan, and he got a $450 check uh, for a bonus back then. That was pretty amazing. Uh, six foot, two and a half inches tall. This whole family, they're, they're, they're giants, and back then that was, that was, uh, uh, Pretty huge, you know. He was only 11th grade at the time, um, but uh, Joe uh, answered the call of service, and he was assigned to the 29th uh, Infantry Division. Um, and he, he did make the comment to um, his, his buddy. Uh, let's see his name, Bob Hopkins. He said, "I'm going to die with my my uh, pictures glove in my hip pocket," and that's not exactly what happened. He was playing catch when an artillery round came in and took his life. Um, and so he's, when you come up to the museum, um, the displays that we have uh, generally have the, the uh, service man or woman's uh, uh, uniform and a couple of effects from them. Uh, maybe some things that we move from display to display also, but uh, for a large part it's their things. But that large photo in the back, if you see that in our museum, it's a silver frame. They survived their conflict. If it's a gold frame around that photo, that's somebody who lost their life in, in, uh, in uh, combat or in, while, while serving our country. So, um, just one of the ways we use it to help tell those stories. Just look to make sure I don't miss anything while I'm going here. Um, let's see. Um, G9 Williams, Lieutenant Commander. Uh, Governor. Uh, yep, yep, the governor of the state of Michigan, uh, famous for his bow ties. Um, in fact, I don't know if you can see here, we've actually got one of his bow ties in the display. Um, used to be a green with white, uh, but it's kind of faded now. Um, that's one thing that's uh, very important with the textiles and everything, trying to prevent the fading. Uh, one of our largest expenses is uh, trying to switch over to LED lighting, uh, or at least make sure that we get uh, uh, some filters on the lights that we do have, um, which all the lights now do have. Um, but uh, he was on the Essex uh, Bunker Hill, Yorktown Hornet, 
um, and uh, incredible uh, ten battle stars throughout his career um, in, in World War II. Um, <coughs> One other thing about Mr. Williams, he was also known as Sophie Williams. Yep, yep, absolutely. So, yeah, so Sophie also served as a Chief Justice on the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Um, as did the guy that followed him uh, into uh, uh, the, in Lansing. Um, uh, the next governor also, we've got his things in there. I'm just, I'm, yeah, Swainson, I just, yes, Swainson, I totally drew a blank, so thank you very much. Uh, governor Swainson, we have his things also. I don't know if you guys knew, he's not from uh, the Detroit area, but when he uh, was over in Europe, he's, uh, there, his unit sets up camp one night and uh, they're setting up camp and they get a detail to go get wood for the cook stoves. And he's going to get wood for the cook stoves and he comes back. And uh, as he comes back, they're uh, uh, getting another detail to take some information to the front and some supplies and get some information from the front. And uh, he's, uh, they said, well, take Swainson. He's still got all his battle gear on and let's take him. So he goes out and he's walking in front of the Jeep uh, and then in the Jeep there's two guys and there's two guys behind the Jeep. That Jeep had a 17 pound teller mine. And when that teller mine went off, it took the lives of the guys that were in the Jeep because it threw the Jeep over. But when the, um, uh, the blast hit the bottom of the Jeep, it, it you know, it, before it uh, uh, lifted it up, it sent a lot of the blast forward. And unfortunately, it took off his legs at the knee. Um, so, if the rest of the time, uh, you know, when he was a governor and everything, he'd run upstairs on his prosthetic legs. He actually had his legs in the museum. Um, it's something that he donated. He says, you can have a little leg, but you can't have my arm. But um, when uh, he ends up, uh, 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 you know, like I said, running upstairs, dancing, jumping off stage at rallies on, on those prosthetic legs, uh, uh, very, um, uh, very inspired kind of guy. Um, who, and he also uh, joined the, uh, the Michigan Supreme Court afterwards, but uh, he got in a little trouble there, so we don't focus on that. Um, thank you, Mary and Carl Foster. A great story. He, he also received the um, Navy Cross and in service. Um, he was from uh, Emmett, Michigan, uh, well, between Emmett and Detroit, he called most of his way. Um, he was a, a Navy Reserve pilot, and uh, he's involved in, uh, he and uh, 13 other Hellcat pilots involved in a battle against uh, a 28 minute air battle. And they had 47 uh, kamikazes in their escorts. They took out those kamikazes in their escorts uh, without a single. Um, uh, uh, casualty to either shipping that they were protecting, the fleet that they were protecting or themselves. Uh, just an amazing thing. You can see he's in this picture back there, he's holding up six fingers with a big cheesy grin. I would be too. Uh, he's just a great guy. Ended the war with eight and a half air victories. Um, in uh, six air medals. Uh, amazing story. Uh, the next one's one of my favorite stories in the museum. Uh, Staff Sergeant Sam Sarpolis from uh, St. Clair. Uh, you can see um, uh, the All-American was the name of the B-17 they were in. And uh, this picture right up, right up here was actually used by Boeing as, a, as an advertisement. Um, the the uh, top gunner on the, uh, the All-American uh, shot a measure Schmidt, and the measure Schmidt, uh, he actually got the got the pilot. The pilot um, was either knocked unconscious or, or died, and uh, the plane dove right into the, the tail. You can see where it almost separated the tail. And actually, after landing, the, the tail came off. But um, the story that, that uh, Sam would tell uh, tell at the at the museum was that um, he actually came out of the tail afraid that it was going to fall off, and the guys that were, the other guys, his other crewmates, all talked to him to go in the back of the tail in order to keep the weight, weight right and everything, and so he's sitting there holding on to whatever he can, and he was just terrified, but he said when they, when they landed, he went and he slugged the, the nearest crewmate that he could find, but um, uh, 
uh, 50th mission, uh, shot through the wrist, wrist on the, uh, his uh, 50th mission. He said that was the, the, the worst that he got. And uh, what, a, what, a, what an end to your, your playing your career, right? Um, next story, uh, a cool story, Ernestine Koch. Um, Ernestine, uh, first lieutenant, she uh, joined a, uh, as a, uh, a Marine recruiter. She, at the time, uh, there were, uh, she wanted to join the Marines because it was an elite service in, in her mind. And uh, there, she, there were only, um, as she told it, she had, uh, 400 female Marines at the time. Um, and um, she was just really thrilled to do it and served as a recruiter. And um, uh, then uh, helped sending uh, troops and such over to Vietnam as well. Um, uh, he retired out uh, a warrant officer. Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, didn't retire a warrant officer. Retired, a retired first lieutenant. I'm sorry. Uh, when she became a, a, a warrant officer, um, uh, she said that was the most proud day of her life, though. Um, first lieutenant Robert Poxon. Uh, Robert Poxon's in our Medal of Honor gallery as well. Robert Poxon um, and First Lieutenant, I can't remember, um, uh, he's uh, 21, 22 years old, somewhere into there. He's, uh, um, uh, his guys are defending an LZ, a landing zone, and uh, just I, what I did here is I, I brought his um, commendation, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, while serving as platoon leader on reconnaissance mission in Tainan Province, uh, Republic of Vietnam, uh, landing, by landing helicopter in an area suspected to be occupied by the enemy, platoon leader came under intense fire uh, from enemy soldiers in concealed positions in fortifications around the landing zone. A soldier fell. Hit by a burst of fire, Lieutenant Poxon dashed to his aid, drawing, uh, drawing the majority of the enemy fire as he crossed 20 meters of open ground. The fallen soldier was beyond help, and Lieutenant Poxon was seriously and painfully wounded. Lieutenant Poxon, with indomitable courage, refused medical aid and evacuation and turned his attention to seizing the initiative from the enemy. With a sure instinct, he marked this a central bunker as the key to success, quickly instructing his men to concentrate the fire on the bunker. In spite of his wound, Lieutenant Poxon crawled toward the bunker, ready to hand grenade and charge. He was hit again, but continued his assault. After succeeding in silencing the enemy guns in the bunker, he was struck once again by enemy fire and fell mortally wounded. Lieutenant Poxon's comrades followed their leader, pressed the attack, and drove the enemy from their positions. First Lieutenant Poxon's uh, gallantry, indomitable will, and courage are in keeping with the uh, highest traditions of military service and reflect like great credit upon himself, his unit in the United States Army. Um, I, we, when we've had people in there that served with uh, Lieutenant Poxon and, and gentlemen that were there that day, um, they say he was just <coughs> unbelievable. They, he went to that guy. He crossed 20 meters of over ground because he didn't think that anybody should die without having, you know, somebody with them. And he knew the guy who was mortally wounded, but he still he still did that. It's just um, what a leader he he was, and and uh, just amazing. Before you start, before you go to uh, yeah. that one, uh, one one post note to that. Uh, when I was at Fort Hood in 1974. Uh, correct, 75 through 77. Uh, the post guest house at Fort Hood was named Poxon House yeah. in honor of Lieutenant Poxon. I can't speak as to as to now, but at that time it was. And so uh, that's one of the uh, thanks for bringing it up. Um, when you walk um, uh, around uh, or, or drive around Michigan, um, you're going to see. Uh, buildings, federal buildings, state buildings, you'll see uh, county buildings, you'll see uh, roads, highways, um, uh, schools, all named after the heroes that you're going to find in the museum. It's amazing how many of these guys uh, did so many amazing things. Um, we've got the most highly decorated enlisted airmen ever in our museum. We've got, like I was saying earlier, five governors of the state of Michigan, 
so many amazing stories and still so many more stories that nobody knows, right? And if you drive down I-75 and you see the sign that says it's a memorial highway, and how many people take the time to actually get to tell those stories? I'm, I'm lucky enough that that's my job, right? And so, uh, but it's each one of those signs and, and stories are, are worth everyone's attention. Um, so yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's a, that's a very good point. Um, over in uh, Pontiac, the old federal building is now um, uh, part of a uh, healthcare organization for the indigent. Um, it, but it's named after uh, Medal of Honor recipient um, uh, Harold Furlong. Harold Furlong is the reason why we have the nation, or the nation, well, the world's largest Medal of Honor collection. He received the Medal of Honor in World War One. He ended up taking. Uh, he was the only guy from Michigan out of the army to receive the Medal of Honor in World War One. He goes and uh, he grabs a grenade here. His, his guys are being pinned down by four Maxim machine guns in a German trench about 100 yards away. He grabs a, a grenadier to start chucking grenades as close to that trench as he can to try and keep their heads down. The grenadier starts throwing. As soon as those grenades start going off, he starts running. He runs over uh, about 100 yards, gets in behind that trench before the grenadier runs out of grenades. He then takes his, uh, his rifle, and once those guys, uh, the the machine gunners open up back on his guys and they're making all that noise they can't hear him as he's aiming down at them from behind and he takes the four machine gunners out that way well there's 20 guys left in the trench and as soon as those machine guns stopped firing they didn't know whether the whether that um uh, had stopped firing because they uh were malfunctioning they didn't know whether they were out of ammo they had no idea what had just happened but they knew without those guns that they were uh, sitting ducks, and they uh, all surrendered to this one, uh, not this gentleman here, but uh, to Harold Furlong. And uh, Harold Furlong, I love telling this story to kids that come through the museum, because uh, he ended up uh, on a very positive note. He, he took, a, after serving um, as a first lieutenant and everything, he, he still served, um, but he, he retired out uh, Colonel for a long, but he, as a doctor, and not just any doctor, he delivered over a thousand babies in his lifetime, oh right? God. And he told Stan, when Stan got his story, he was Stan, uh, the other Medal of Honor recipients would tell Stan, you know what, you can uh, talk to Dr. Furlong. If you can get his his things, or if he gives you his blessing, we'll, we'll you know, consider bringing our stuff. And so he gets, uh, he gets Dr. Furlong uh, to get him to, to donate his things to the museum. And then the, Dr. Furlong sends out a letter to the guys in the, uh, Michigan's military, or uh, Michigan's uh, Medal of Honor Society. And they, uh, in this letter says, hey, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I believe this guy's gonna tell my story, you know, at, at his museum, the same way I always would. And these guys looked up to Harold so much that that's the reason why they donated their things. Um, or they pledged a future donation uh, of it upon their, uh, upon their death. Um, so that's, that's the reason why we have so many things, because this guy was looked up as a father and grandfather, um, Harold, that is. So Harold ends up, uh, at the end of his story, the way that Stan always said we would, and the way we still end up telling his story, is he said he wanted to be remembered for bringing life into the world, not taking it out, right? That's that's um, that's why he, the way he wanted to be remembered, and that's the way we will always finish his story. Um, but that's also another cool story. Uh, it's it's not a, a, a local local story, but eh, Southeast Michigan story. And I know you guys probably know the the career of uh, Captain Lineager better than most, right? Uh, he's got. Uh, his medical degree, a PhD, a couple of master's degrees, and uh, just an amazing guy. Um, and for those of you guys that uh, didn't follow him when he was up on Mir, uh, he, there was a uh, fire on board, and he uh, went and he goes, grabs a respirator, puts the respirator on, grabs a um, uh, fire extinguisher, fights his way to the fire, 
deploys a fire extinguisher and finds out that in the near zero gravity of space uh, uh, up at the mirror, that that fire extinguisher, as any kid that now watches Wally, -E, uh, the show, the Disney show, knows that a fire extinguisher in that near zero gravity is a thrusting <laughs> mechanism. And, and he went uh, he went backwards, yep, and he ends up uh, striking the bulkhead behind him. And, and uh, by that time, the uh, commander, the Soviet commander, was in that capsule, and that Soviet commander uh, grabbed the fire extinguisher, and, and uh, um, uh, Jerry grabs him around the legs and, and holds him still, but um, Jerry uh, is the favorite guest of um, Frank Beckman in the morning, so if you guys listen to Frank Beckman, uh, probably all four times a year you can hear Jerry on there. Um, and uh, uh, Frank is not afraid to tell everybody that he's he's his favorite uh, his favorite interview. Um, but at the time when he was on the Mir space station, he served uh, longer in space than anybody else. That's now been broken by the um, uh, the twin brothers, and I can't remember their last name off the top of my head. Um, but it's it's now been broken. Um, Gabby Gifford's husband is one of those twins, and I cannot remember the life name for life of me. Um, but uh, the last story that I have is that of Stan Bozich. Um, Stan, during Korea, he uh, uh, went and served in the Navy. Um, he was a Detroit area firefighter. Um, and in 1974, he visited the Soviet Union. And uh, he, when they did, the um, <coughs> they were returning the colors from one of the, the units that were uh, 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 captured and, um, in uh, uh, World War II um, by the Nazis, and then uh, the Americans ended up coming home with that, with that as, a, as a trophy. So he ends up, in 74, they visit there to return this, and when they're there, they end up... Uh, going on a cross-country trail, uh, train ride and everything, and they visit a bunch of different uh, uh, little townships uh, in their, their uh, township buildings. They would have uh, a post office library, things like that, and a little hall. And um, they would have, uh, off in the corner, uh, they'd have a three to five displays of the local heroes from the Great War. And that's where Stan got the idea. He said he was already a collector, uh, and his brothers were also collectors. That he said, you know what, I can do this, and I can tell these stories, but not just for the Detroit area, not just for the Oak area, not just uh, Southeast Michigan. I can tell the stories of the state of Michigan, and we've got some amazing stories that we tell uh, on a continuous, continual basis there. Um, and then I think I mentioned that I was going to talk a little bit about the last story that I got. I think that's that's all that I had for, um, for actual stories. So the last story that I got, um, just this last week, um, when was our meeting, Mike? Was it Thursday? Thursday? So yeah, so it was on Wednesday then. On Wednesday, I got to drive down to Commerce Township and meet with the voice of uh, Detroit Lions uh, and the Wolverines, Jim Brandstetter. And uh, Jim Brandstetter played for the Wolverines uh, uh, back when uh, Bo first became coach, but his story wasn't his story. It was his dad's story, General Brandstetter. General Brandstetter uh, played originally for Michigan State, as did Jim's older brother. Um, but uh, General Brandstetter um, served World War II, Korea, right on through um, Vietnam, he was in charge of uh, uh, POWs and such. Um, he ended up uh, coming home and uh, serving uh, in the reserves, but he also served uh, his country as um, uh, when he was at uh, MSU. Uh, he <coughs> served as their uh, head of the uh, Department of uh, Law Enforcement. And then he also served as their their uh, police chief there on, in, in Eastern uh, Michigan, Eastern Lansing there, and he ends up um, not only uh, that, but 
the federal law enforcement uh, training center, FLETC, trains all of the, the customs agents, all the marshals, like every federal officer goes through uh, the FLETC, they call it, Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. And um, he got a call from FLETC uh, back when um, uh, Carter was the president, and he said uh, they'd like to interview. And he said, well, why, where'd you get my name from? He says, well, we've got a list of finalists here. And each one of those guys say that you train them. So we want the guy that trained these amazing guys to be in charge of our training. And so he went and he interviewed, and he did it. He, he uh, um, was the uh, head of Fletzi through um, uh, some of uh, Raven's administration and also. So um, that's our last, uh, the last story we've gotten in. It's going to be our 875th story, and I can't wait to get it typed up and get it out there. So, um, Amazing stories, amazing heroes, and I don't care whether somebody was a clerk typist or um, uh, a whack or whatever. I, I've got one guy um, that uh, I, I meet with on a regular basis, it seems, and uh, he's from Davidson, and uh, he was a, a cook on an LST. <coughs> and I'm, I'm still trying to convince him that his story belongs in our museum. Uh, and one of the funniest things is he says. Um, uh, my claim to fame is I never lost a man as a cook, so I, I you know what, he's got a great sense of humor, amazing guy. But um, those, any, any stories, they're all heroes, right? They, have, they all signed up and to do whatever the government asked them to do. And, and we consider those guys and girls our heroes at the museum. And so a lot of you guys here thank you guys for your service as well. Um, but does anybody have any questions about the museum? Or what any of the stories we have? What any of the stories I went over? Anybody know of any stories that ought to be eternally out of respect and remember at the museum? Yeah. Have you ever thought about going back to the Spanish American War and the maybe the Civil War? Yeah, so the the problems with the Civil War items is they're all locked up on the East Coast, right? And so uh, to get those stories, um, they're already being told, right? And and that's awesome. We're happy that they're being told, um, but a lot of those stories are already there. Spanish American War, um, those are hard to come by. Also, uh, we just received our second full story for the uh, Spanish American War. So we can tell the stories, um, and we can tell the stories in books in, 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 in different ways, but we'll never, probably, I shouldn't say never, because now, next week I'll get another one, right? But it's, it's hard to find the full stories the way that we display them with the uniforms and, and everything. Uh, that said, if I get uh, stories of these individuals, we still record, we still want the history, and then those are stories that eventually we're looking to get on our website, we're looking to get out there so people can understand what all these men and women have done for us. So, but I, I don't have a, a lot of that stuff all right now from the Spanish Civil War. I do have a few um, stories from uh, the Civil War. Uh, they were uh, Medal of Honor recipients. In fact, we've got one guy, a uh, Medal of Honor recipient, that thought that he said that the, uh, he sent a letter back to the government saying that uh, this little tin badge you sent me uh, might uh, be nice for the drummer of the, Ameri or of the uh, Salvation Army, but it, you know, really, you're going to give this to the, uh, your war heroes? So they went and they, uh, um, he actually spent some of his, his own money to help redesign that metal and to, into what you see you know, today. So that's really uh, funny stuff. But. Yeah. Did you ever get that um, Civil War Medal of Honor recipients picture that Charlie Kettles was supposed to have sent you? Um, I, you know what? I don't know that I uh, checked to see if I did it. Yeah. Yeah. So. <coughs> but um, we've got uh, some uh, some really cool stories uh, coming up here. I think I was just telling somebody here before we got started. There's a uh, uh, down in Romeo, Michigan. There is a uh, I was made aware of it yesterday. There's a um, Medal of Honor recipient from the uh, uh, Philippine Insurrection, uh, 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 Marine, 
who's, uh, we know the story at the museum. Uh, Stan wrote books on all of the Medal of Honor recipients um, in Michigan, or from Michigan. And, uh, but his tombstone is just a regular Army, uh, uh, Marine tombstone. And so we would like to um, get that changed out and um, put a, uh, um, uh, the, the correct, uh, I'm sorry, it was Army. Um, uh, we want to get the, the proper Medal of Honor tombstone there. And uh, I have a feeling by <coughs> tomorrow this time, I'll have made the right connections to get that um, done because the, it needs to be done, right? The, the city of Romeo right now is trying to raise money to, do, to change that out themselves. And I said, well, geez, um, I bet you the federal government, we, we got the right contacts. I'm confident that we can get that done on the federal government's dime. Why don't you still plan your fundraiser that you're talking about and everything, and use that to put signs on the, on, on the road and let people know that you're proud home of a uh, Medal of Honor recipient from the, you know, so. Um, uh, it sounds that like that might be something they're going to do. How does that look different? I guess I, I like to walk cemeteries. I'm always looking for um, yep. World War One, World War Two, or Korea. They always say it, or Vietnam. Yep. But so it'll actually, it'll actually have the the metal on it. Let me see if I can. Well, it's not, it doesn't really uh, show it good either of those photos. But the actual uh, medal of their service. So if it's the the Navy version uh, for the Navy Coast Guard Marines or if it's the Army version or the Air Force version, the Air Force version, uh, believe it or not, is really big and audacious compared to the other ones. So we wouldn't expect that at all, would we? But it's kind of funny. Um, but, uh, so there's, they would, they would have that on there. I don't see it. On the tombstone itself? Yeah. Yeah, on the tombstone, yeah. It's, I've got a couple be... pictures on my... Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'll find them. Cool. Um, you might want to tell them, and I know it's not displayed at the museum, but Bob Fonte's story from East Point. Yeah, and so I honestly, um, you're probably better with the story than I am. Um, yeah. But uh, during a wreath across America, um, uh, Karen came across his his uh, tombstone, and he did not have a um, uh, what was he? he? Didn't have a military stone at all? No, he had a, he, he was a cross military stone. Right? It's at Resurrection. And um, as my husband and I were placing a wreath, we noticed he was, it said Vietnam, and a PH, so we knew Purple Heart. But it was two weeks after he turned 20. And as soon as we got in the car, huh? Yeah. So as soon as we got in the car, I went and I Googled it. Bob Fonte grew up in East Point. Um, he was killed the second tour of duty in Vietnam, and posthumously he received the Navy Cross. That headstone did not tell you that. And if you read that citation, so I found his mother, who's 94, and he has a brother. <coughs> and John and I went to the house and talked. His father was, died of a heart attack in 1964 at 43. Four years later, Bob was killed in Vietnam. Four years after that, his 23-year-old sister was killed by a drunk driver in East Point. That mother and what she went through, she was left with one son. But his story over there, that was the second tour of duty. After his first one, he spent six months recovering from shrapnel. He came home and said, I have to go back because the Marines is the only sane place to be. And he was providing so much on. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You no. know, you know no, me. Yeah, no, 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 no. That, that was funny. I was just, I, was just, I, I had the great when you said the Marines was the only same place to be. Well, um, he said because of all the right. protests. Right. Oh, right. Absolutely. And that tells you how messed up the country was at the time, right? Um, so it was, it was uh, um, an amazing story. And, and his mom uh, declined to send the story to the museum because she said he was. A very private man. He, he, he wouldn't have wanted that, right, for himself. And I thought that was really cool. And I said, well, anything you need to do to, in, in helping preserve the story in honor, respect, and remember it, it, the museum's there to help. Um, see, we don't need to have uh, the things, and 
when somebody wants to donate a story to the museum, um, the first thing I'll do is insist that they come up and see the museum and see how we're going to treat those stories. And then the next thing I'm going to do is tell them, um, we'll help you do any research you want, anything that you need on the unit, on, on the individuals, whatever you want to, do, uh, to help you honor respect to <coughs> your grandfather, your uh, aunt, whoever it is, right? And um, if they decide that the museum is the right place to have that story told, we'll gladly do it, tell it. But one way or another, I want to make sure that the family understands that they have a story of a hero. It doesn't matter um, any veteran story, right? That, that they're a hero. So um, a lot of times those stories get divided up and parsed out. Uh, one grandson will get this, a granddaughter will get that, and, and, and the stories get divided up and lost forever. And so that's one of the things that we try to make sure that it doesn't happen, that the, that family understands and takes, takes pride in, in that story. And then, um, you know, uh, it's just very important to that family and, and to our heritage as a, as a state and as a nation. So, um, any other questions? Cool. Um, that's all that I really had for today. Um, and uh, the only um, criteria we have is they must have lived in Michigan at some point in their life. Uh, we've got one guy that uh, he puts in there that he's from Ohio. He was. He was a. He was one of those polar bears that um, Mike was up here telling you about a few uh, a month ago or two. And uh, but he uh, only was in Michigan while he was at Battle Creek, right? In, in, in his uh, basic training. Well, you know what? Battle Creek was his, uh, um, at Camp Custer, that was his uh, address for a period of time, so that'll work. That'll work. Um, provide discharge paperwork for verification purposes um, in the, you know, uh, a uniform. It didn't even need to be a full uniform. Um, something that uh, was theirs, um, and then uh, photographs if we can. I've got one gentleman who um, uh, was from the Midland area, and uh, there's no photo that really exists of him any good at all. We, nothing that we could uh, um, uh, do. It was almost like a passport photo, and it was uh, so grainy and, and uh, distorted, it was hard to see. Well, we had an artist that uh, took care of that. The reason why that story was important to us, though, is this gentleman died in uh, Korea as a POW, and we want to make sure we honored respect and remember his story as well. Um, yeah. Can I, can I just add one thing to the sure. on his story? After he had met his headstone, he had nothing on it. And I contacted his mother and his brother. Um, number one, the cemetery dedicated a, um, um, what do you call it? A plaque, you know, the rounded thing. And it put on there, Bob Ponte, um Navy Cross, KIA, Afghanistan. But his brother, Vietnam had it. But his brother was able to have Navy Cross recipient added to his headstone. Yeah. Yeah. So that people won't just walk over it and oh, he'll have been dead 50 years this August, so what? Absolutely. Um, but you know, so uh, the museum has the largest collection of, of, of Medal of Honor recipients um, and, and a large collection of cross recipients. But those aren't the only heroes, right? If you talk to a Medal of Honor recipient, they'll be the first one to say that um, uh, I wear this for the guys that were over there with me, for the guys that didn't come home, for the guys that did come home and go through the same nightmares I did, right? Uh, that's the first thing that those guys will, will mention. Um, so uh, the museum, we tell their stories, but we tell so many other stories, so many amazing stories. And, and if you haven't been out there, we'd love to have you guys come up and, and take a look at the museum and, and uh, let somebody else know about it because, uh, boy, do, do we need to let people know about the proud service of, of, of our citizens of our state. So um, with that, if, yes? Comment on the future that you're planning? So, uh, in, the, in the future, um, we've got a, a, a board of, of uh, full of uh, new.
newer faces and everything, and a bunch of uh, uh, really amazing people, <coughs> all of them that are on our board. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be doing, uh, a couple of things this, uh, this uh, uh, fall, and one of them is uh, we're going to be talking about the polar bears. We're going to be down at, uh, in, in Detroit, actually, uh, doing that. On September 5th, we're going to be, um, it'll be in the evening, uh, we're going to be talking at the um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, building down there, just south of, of um, uh, the Greentown Casino. And um, I can't remember the name of the building. It was the Wimmer Building. The Wimmer Building, yeah. Yeah, a nice auditorium in there. Four yeah. seats. And, and we're going to have a talk on the polar bears. And okay, it's not going to, it's, it's no charge uh, to come and, and, and learn about the polar bears there. Um, and we're going to have a couple of uh, people, a couple of authors that are talking about it. Then we're going to have, um, on, November, on November 10th, we're going to have our, um, at the, Suburban Collection Showplace. We're going to do a uh, large banquet honoring the hundred year, uh, uh, the last hundred years of heroes. So we've got uh, it'll be the day before the armistice was signed in World War One, right? A hundred years earlier. So um, we're going to be doing that in a, in a big fashion there. So, um, but in in the in the the grand scheme of the future of the museum, we're looking to um, find a way to expand. Tell more stories. Get um, make sure that the stories that we have are seen by people and appreciated by people. They, everybody needs to know um, uh, this this heritage, right? Everybody everybody knows their favorite uh, rock star or uh, Beyonce story or I don't even know Kim Kardashian story or whatever. <coughs> Who the heck cares, right? I mean, I, I'm sure it's important to. A couple people, but why? I don't. I don't know. Um, so these these stories here. These are the rock stars. These are the the amazing individuals. And these this is the type of stuff we want want to um, make sure that people focus on. So cool. Well, thank you guys very much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Guys.